I, I promise you I'm not scrolling when I'm up here. I got things written down on my phone and um, whatnot. So, morning church. So I titled the sermon, uh, Perspectives of a New Christian, Identifying and Breaking Down the Barriers to Spread the Word and Grow the Church. I'll tell you, it's uh, a little daunting getting up here in this capacity, first time here. kind of wanted to find myself back out through those doors, so bear with me. I'll hit the groove, but let me uh, just start by saying I didn't clear this sermon with anyone. This is just me talking to you guys. As a new Christian, if anything I share today rubs you the wrong way, it's on me. It's not on anybody else. But let me preface this. The things I'm going to bring up today, by and large, this congregation does a pretty good job on. Hence why I'm standing up here now. But there's always room for growth and improvement. I wanted to take the opportunity to reflect a little bit on some of the journey that I've gone through personally and that Kim's gone through and maybe some of the roadblocks that we had to deciding to stay here in the church to join the body of Christ and maybe offer a little different perspective that sometimes we take for granted especially you've grown up in the church or you've been coming here for a while it's easy to lose sight of what it takes to make that decision. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is we can do a lot of things poorly that can cause people not to join us. So when I'm standing up here, it's me talking. I'm going to sit down at various points in this. And when I'm sitting down, I am representing somebody that has just walked through those doors for the first time. They're coming in. They're in a fresh face. They don't know us. Yeah, I'm going to be telling you what's maybe going through their heads a little bit and offer a perspective in there and maybe some insights on what we can do to help that person continue to come in. So to get the most out of this sermon... I ask that you put yourself in the mindset of someone walking through the doors back there for the first time. Maybe you grew up in the church and went your own way. Maybe you had some bad experiences with the church. Maybe you're a little wild and rebellious. None of us have been there. Maybe you decided to turn against the teachings of your family and went off and tried to make it on your own took everything that they tried to raise you with and did just the opposite, just for spite. But now, for whatever reason, maybe you're going through some hard times, maybe you're going through some challenges, you're trying to find your way back. Or, maybe you just didn't know any better growing up. Nobody provided you that teaching, nobody gave you the opportunity to go to church. Or, heaven forbid, Maybe they mocked it, frowned upon it, and now you're curious. Whatever the circumstances, the fact is that you decided to walk through those doors. Just getting here probably took some serious thought, some struggle, and some persuasion. You're not coming in alone, but... You're walking in, and man, it took some doing to get here. You're walking through those doors. Maybe you know a few people. Maybe not. Maybe you're just coming in off the street. Maybe somebody brought you along. One of our, one of our congregation said, hey, come with me. It sounds like you're looking for something in your life. You're nervous. You feel anxious. You don't know what to expect. You're out of your comfort zone. You don't know how to act, what to say, and all these new faces are coming up to you. Big smiles, clapping you on the back, welcoming you. 
and you're trying to match up faces and names and try to keep track of who's who and what's what. I don't know about you guys, but on any given day, I can't do that. Even if I'm amongst people I know, it takes me forever to try to learn somebody's name. I have to use it 50 times. It's just too much. You're sweating, you're looking around. What's the quickest way out of here? <laughs> you wanna turn back around and walk out? You've made the effort to get here. You made it this far. You're here for a reason. You might not even know what that reason is. But somehow, some way, you walk through those doors. Maybe just take a seat in the back, you sit down and keep your mouth shut and do everything you can to keep from drawing any more attention to yourself. Maybe you'll be able to fade away into the crowd. Maybe they'll just ignore you for a little bit. Just let you test the waters and see what this is all about. All right. You feel me here? You got your mindset? Walking in for the first time, take yourself back to that first time you came in here. Maybe you're coming from a different church. I hope you're in that individual's head. Because it doesn't stop there. So, let's think about this for a second. You're coming in and maybe you've not been raised in church. Or it's been a while since you've studied. There's a lot to learn. This book right here. How long are we taking to read it in our Bible study? A year. And how many of us are actually keeping up on our reading? Or are we struggling to fight with getting it done every day? Or... Friday evening rolls around, Saturday morning, we're going, oh man, I'm four days behind. I guess I better sit down and get this done. And that's with us being comfortable here. Having an idea that this is something we want to learn. Let alone going, wait a second, what's this all about? Who are all these names? So, we're going to go into our friend's thoughts here for just a minute. A year to read this, let alone understand this key central document of the church. It seems everybody knows it except me. These guys are piping off and quoting verses left and right. Sometimes bringing in 50 supporting references or possible illusions. They, and they look at me like I should know what they're talking about. Plus understand the context and the intricacies of ancient Greek. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here with this free Bible I was given. Or maybe I got it from my grandmother. Man, that thing looks like it's been beat up. But it's filled with these and thous and chows. I feel like I'm trying to read and understand Shakespeare while they're debating how many souls Legion refers to. All I care about it is it's a lot. Wait, didn't someone just mention lot as well? It's the only Bible I have. It's printed in font so small I need a magnifying glass to read it. On onion paper so thin I can hardly tell which letters are on the right side of the page. I don't even know who King James is. But I know I can't hardly understand a single sentence out of here without a PhD in Old English. You guys ever felt that way before? So let's think about this for a second. I don't want to blow you guys out with two microphones going at once. That's the only one actually working. Oh, okay. I can only hear myself up here, so. <laughs> let's think about this. How often do we try to spread the word of God, the word of Christ, by handing somebody a Bible? We think that, all right, I'll give it to them. We'll see if they do anything with it. But what Bible are we giving them? All too often, we're handing them 
the King James Version. Can they actually understand it? Can they get through the these, the nows, and shalls, and everything else, let alone even in, you know, an ESV or NIV, whatever version you choose to read, the names in there, you can't even hardly read them yourself. You stumble over them and go, wait a second, how do I say that? Let alone throw in other little intricacies in there. So I challenge you. If you're going to give somebody a Bible, give them a Bible that they can actually read. Give them something that's printed on legitimate paper. That little onion paper, you try to read it, you're almost reading the back side of the page at the same time. You give them a language that they can't understand, you're just throwing a roadblock into them. They're going to look at this thing and go, what the heck, I can't read this. What are they trying to say here? Versus we give them something written in modern language. Does it lose its value? There may be a little bit of stuff that gets lost in translation here and there, some of those intricacies. But until they're into the church and they're going to full study and going in depth, is it going to make a difference? Or will they actually be able to understand that book that you've given them? Lost my spot here. <laughs> Take out that deeper wedge, or take that wedge out. Just give them, give them something you would like to read. Something that gets, gets you those core points. The other thing I want to remind you guys, you're coming in, that person's coming in from whatever background they may have. They don't know what's going on. They don't care about 50 different intricacies here and there to make, support this verse. They're just trying to get the meat and potatoes of what's being said there. All too often we get caught up on debating this point versus that point, this number versus that number. Meanwhile, they're thinking, wait a second, where did we just start? What are we talking about here? We lose them when we lose the point. We lose that essential topic that we're talking about. By pulling in too many different things. And it almost seems like at times we're almost in competition with each other. Trying to see who can pull out the most obscure reference here or there. Of, uh, hey, I know my Bible inside and out. There's not a prize for it. I'll give you guys right off the bat. You're coming in a whole lot better verses than I ever have been. And probably ever will be. But... At the end of the day, is that going to help my understanding that we're pulling 50 different ways? Or do I just need to understand that one point to start with? And we'll go from there. If you keep on that topic, I'll be listening. I'll be in, bought in. But let me stay focused. Keep it on task. It's not a competition. Once you lose somebody, it's so hard to get them brought, brought back in. I think of some of those earlier, so, what, two years ago now, the first Bible studies I started coming into, going, wait a second, we are just talking about this. How did we get over here? This feels like left field. I'm lost. And then we changed the topic a little bit. And I'm still trying to check back in. Because you lost me at the beginning help that person out I got fat thumbs <laughs> the other piece of that common knowledge inside the church ain't so much common knowledge out there I can tell you, when Kim and I first started coming here, you know, we were just starting down this path long before we were ever baptized and took communion or anything along those lines, any of those rites of passages. Somebody would bring up a story that 
they think everybody knows. And maybe if you grew up in the church, you know it. But if you didn't grow up in the church, it's loss. You need to take that step back sometimes and lay that background information. If you're going to bring up a, a supporting detail or something along those lines, give them that background. Tell them where it's coming from. Tell them why it's important. That way they can understand. That way they can stay engaged. But if you're pulling, pulling something out of right field to support left field, they're not going to follow you. I mean, wait, where'd that come from? You know, it may even be something as simple as some of those stories that we all think of as kids, whether we're talking about Samson, which we just read within the last week here, or David and Goliath. Heck, I remember there was a... Kim and I were talking about this last week. She didn't know the story of the Last Supper and the First Communion and the crucifixion. And somebody brought up Judas. And she looked at Harold and said, wait a second, who's Judas? That's one of those facts that as a member of the church, it's common knowledge. But if you're walking in and you've never been exposed to that, are you going to know that? I'm sure Kim may uh, have a few words to say about uh, me calling back some of that hindsight memories in there. Because I'll be honest, it's embarrassing at times. It's hard to speak up and ask those questions when you don't follow. Especially if you're already in that mindset of not being comfortable, not knowing who you're with, not knowing the faces in the room. It's hard to speak up. Joining the church takes a huge leap of faith, literally. And the pun is intended there. There's so much to learn. There's so much to understand. And let's be frank. Most of it doesn't make sense. There's a lot that's illogical, can't be proven. That's why we call it faith. But with all that being said, that leap of faith and accepting these, those things, they're inexplicable and taking on faith alone is often easier than accepting the human elements of the church. And not just the church, honestly, of ourselves. Accepting others in the congrega congregation, accepting our own opportunities, because goodness knows, we're not perfect. And we can often be our own worst enemy. I'll tell you, prob now, we're going to go back to our friend's thoughts here in just a second, but I'll tell you, probably the hardest thing about joining the church was being willing to look past some of the individuals of the church. Yeah. Going back to my first exposures, I, I was dating a girl back in college, and I started going to church with her. And it was a a startup mega church. And it's a, definitely a full mega church now. But I was very early on. I was still learning. Uh, goodness knows I'm still learning now. But the way in which I felt judged led me to walk away from it. And at that time, I was considering marrying that girl. And I ended up getting dumped because I wasn't Christian enough. So. It took a little bit of uh, soul healing to be able to even entertain the idea of coming here. We're coming to a church again. But let's go visit our friend again. Let's get inside there. Go ahead. Man, I don't belong here. These people, they're saints. They grew up in the church. They know this book cover a cover and quote, can quote it word for word. Not to mention the way they carry themselves. I doubt they've ever done anything wrong. If they knew half of what I've done in my life, they would kick me out of this place in a heartbeat. I mean, I'm trying to turn my life around, but I've seen some stuff. I've done a lot of stuff that I know I shouldn't have done. Heck, ask my ex-wife. They'd love to give you all the dirt on how, how terrible I am. And while I'm working on being better, I still struggle. I got my vices and skeletons in the closet. 
there's no way I can let them know about all that. Or I know they won't have anything to do with me. I hear how they talk about others. Plus, why would God want me? Why would he forgive all that I've done wrong? I mean, I can't blame any of them. I don't even want to be around me most of the time. I hear you guys reacting to some of that. That tells me that you're paying attention. You can feel it. Part of what we take for granted sometimes is that we do do wrong, that we are sin, we are sinners, we are imperfect. But to somebody walking in that doesn't know you, how do you carry yourself? Do you acknowledge that weakness? Do you acknowledge that temptation? Do you acknowledge that humility? Because I'll tell you, when they're walking in and it's a new crowd, somebody they don't know, they're going to find any reason they can to try to distance themselves at first. To look for a reason why they're the outsider. To why they don't belong. They're looking for that excuse to walk back out those doors and never come back. I'm not saying that you need to go out there and lay your life story on the line and tell them everything you've done wrong in your life. But if you can take down your tone a little bit and get rid of that air of holier than thou is probably the best way I've heard to phrase it. Then they feel that they can relate to you. It starts building that bond of trust. That connection. But if you've got that holier than thou aura about you, they don't feel like they can come up to you. They don't feel like they can open up and ask you one of those stupid questions or say, hey man, I'm struggling right now. I've got XYZ issue. And that's what got me here today. I'm looking for help. How can you change your persona so you're approachable? So they feel bought in. You, that there's, you're somebody that they want to come talk to. That makes all the difference in the world. I'll tell you. It doesn't take much to turn somebody off to turn them away. There were many times, many weekends, where we'd come in, and we'd hear a little offhand comment here, a little gossip there. Maybe it was something that wasn't directed to us, but we felt it was. We'd go home, and we'd have our, our hackles raised, so upset, going, why are we even going there? We don't belong there. All because of one little remark here or there. What got us through is oftentimes one of us would be the voice of reason. We'd talk each other down off of that, that anger point, for lack of a better way of putting it, and say, you know, they probably weren't even talking about us, but at the same point, it does hurt. The only other thing that got us through is we were blessed with a couple of individuals that made it their point to get us here. To field those stupid questions, fill in those blanks for us, to love us and nurture us, to grow us and develop us. To the point where we wanted to be here. Some of them are still here. Some of them have moved on. <coughs> I know there are some people that really didn't want us here. And they had their, their issues with us for whatever reason. And they, they made no qualms about it. But at the end of the day, the love of... If you, Yuki individuals 
made all the difference in the world. You have that power. You have that ability to nurture somebody, to bring them along. Even if you don't feel like you have that gumption to be able to lead them, to develop them, the least you could do is not stand in their way, not to be an acting force to tur- give them that reason to turn around and not come back. But if you've got somebody you care about, as we all should, make it known. Be that person for them. Give them that encouragement. Don't make those little snide remarks. That's the best way I can think about it. Because the truth is, we all know sin. Focus on the sin and why it's a sin, but not the sinner. When you make a comment about a sinner and how wrong they are, that gives them that excuse. That turns them away. Rather than teaching them or helping them understand how to be better, how to turn it around, how to do right. The approach makes all the difference in the world. You never know what somebody else is going through or where they've been or where they've come from until they open up to you. And even then, you get about that much out of the whole pie. Maybe they, maybe they had a divorce. Maybe they had abuse. Maybe they've had substance abuses. Maybe they've, whatever the case may be. How many hundreds of different ways of sinning are there? I guarantee if we look around this room and we're honest with ourselves, there's somebody that can probably relate to where they've been. But they don't know that when they're walking in. They don't know your story. It's so easy to turn somebody away. Yes, I'm going off the script. (laughs) I don't envy Harold being up here every week trying to keep his thoughts in a row. He does a pretty good job, right? I tell you, just from my perspective, Harold's one of the Harold and Courtney are a large part of why we're here. Because when we first started coming, we started coming primarily because of the kids and wanting to give them a perspective that they won't get otherwise. To try to offset some of the negative influence that they get other places in their life. And I was honestly skeptical. But I came in and I scheduled a time to talk with Harold and let him know where I was at and where I was coming from. And he just said, you know what? Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing with me, for opening up. I'll help you however I can. I'm here to help you. My ultimate goal is to bring you into the body. But I'll let you guide that. And he was there for us all the way through. And still there now because the battle's not over. But I'll tell you guys that since we got baptized, what was it? It was July, August, somewhere right in there. It became a whole lot easier to look past some of those comments that would have raised our hackles. It's been a whole lot easier since finding the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, to look past some of those people elements, to look past the the offhand remarks, 
to things that we would have taken offense to because now we understand that, once again, this is just a building. The church is here in all of us. We were all mortal. And half the time, we, no, more than half the time, majority of the time, we don't consider the consequences and the impact that our words may have. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I guess you guys haven't tarred and feathered me yet, so I haven't, you know, ruffled the feathers too bad. But I challenge you. How can you knock down the barriers for somebody to find Christ? To make this a place that they're comfortable, where they want to come in, where they want to learn. How can you help them learn? How can you bring them along? Can you fill in the gaps for them? Can you give them that smile? Can you listen to their story? Because I'll tell you, one of the things that our, our friend brought up coming from but um, <laughs> is why would God want want that individual why would God want us the truth is for somebody to get in their car drive here walk through those doors and walk in this building here that took some serious work that took them being compelled or maybe you're more comfortable with the term call. Come here. To get here that first time. And every time since then. God chose that person. To come here. He acted on them. To get into the car. And get here. And who are we. To judge that person. When God's saying. Go to church. Find my word. That's not us. That's not our place in things. Our job is to help that person, support them, develop them. Only God can forgive whatever they've done in their lives. And, you know, Harold asked me for what I wanted on the, the bulletin. You know, it's that open door. That's the way our door should be. They should be looking welcoming. They should be looking like somewhere you want to walk into. And the verse, we got to remember, nobody gets to the Father except for through the Son. But if you don't know the Son, where else are you going to learn? If you're starting somewhere, let it be here. Because that person walked through the door, they may not know it. They may not know him. And there's nothing wrong with that. Honestly, that's probably a lot better position to be in than walking in with bad experiences, with preconceived notions, all those things that may have driven them away from the church before. And those that are coming in with opportunities from the past, they've got even more of an uphill battle. But we can turn that around for them. So, thank you. Hopefully, you guys can go home, think and assess a little bit about what I was presented, and be a better steward for the church. Be a better steward for Christ. Because there's no other way. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be standing up here right now to have this opportunity. And... It doesn't end. Plain and simple. Life's trials and tribulations keep going on. But I know collectively we can bear a lot and we can share a lot. So, thank you guys.